Good morning to you all. My name is Shana and together with friends, I'm really pleased to offer this service to you today. Although we are meeting virtually, I invite you to create a sacred space with me, wherever you are right now. Rest into the space where you are sitting, becoming aware of your feet on the floor. and the weight of your body on the chair. Paying attention to your posture. You might like to close your eyes or soften your gaze at this moment. Taking three intentional breaths. Bringing into this space your whole self, the parts that are raw and exposed, the part that is beaming with joy. Opening your heart, laying down your burden, lifting up your hopes. Gently bringing your attention to your screen. You might like to switch to gallery view and looking at the faces present. Some new and others familiar. Let us welcome each other here, now into this moment. Let us worship together. So I'll start our time together by lighting the chalice flame. Now light it with a global chalice lighting. These words are being spoken by Unitarians and Universalists around the world at the same time. Breath of the universe, gentle and strong, revive the flame of our resilient souls. Breathe new life into desolate hearts, prisoners of pain and fear of the future. Return to blow over the tumultuous waters of our history and give them a direction. As morning light, remove the darkness from our eyes and inspire the mind of every human being so that it may understand the folly of barriers dictated by ignorance and selfishness. Help us feel free to collaborate better in the construction of meaning on which we work together. Let us sing together, joining into this time with friends from Univer Unitarian Universalist Church, Berkeley, and sing Gathered Here.
race, white privilege. This seems like a challenging topic to raise and I'd considered how we might bring attention to it during a spiritual gathering where people might hope for nourishment on a Sunday morning. As a spiritual community of open minds, as justice seekers, I feel this does fit with the spirit of our congregation. There's so much to say and share. And we'll be hearing from Reverend Jim Corrigal and James Chiriankandanth later. I'm also pleased to welcome my friend JJ Akinlade, who joins us from Ghana. JJ is a writer, poet, performer, facilitator and arts activist who creates in many forms. I'd like to start by asking you to consider for a moment how often you think about race. When do these thoughts come to mind? Where are you? Who are you with? And if you are white, how often do you think about your white privilege? If you've noticed any feelings of discomfort, I invite you to sit with that. Taking an intentional breath, I invite you to place one hand on your chest and one hand over your abdomen, resting here for a moment. taking an intentional breath and releasing your hands to where it feels comfortable. I invite you now into a time of prayer and meditation as we sit with our hearts full of our joys and full of our concerns. And as the migrant crisis worsens, we pray. We cry out for those seeking solace, for the rescue of those at sea.
If you are holding someone in your heart this morning, I invite you to say their name aloud in the coming moments of stillness. And through this virtual connection, may we also hold them in our collective prayers. Spirit of life and love, God of our hearts, we give thanks for those who bring us joy and pray for the safekeeping of those whom we hold in concern. For all those names spoken in our homes, uttered in our hearts, may they be surrounded by the loving kindness we offer them today. Blessed be, and amen. Hey everyone, I'm JJ Akinlade, and this is The Choice. Fleeing from home, fleeing from hell, gazing on the unknown while drenched in the smell of anxiety, desperation, and hope. All these and more packed tight in one moaning boat. To cross these lines that border the insane, the other, the inhumane, in separate states of seclusion and aggression. These borderlines they are the weapon. And beneath the beaten hull lie mountains of skulls, a deep damp dread in liquid lull, under tons of pressure, because of a pressure on certain nationalities, names, tongues, traditions, tones, and shades that choke children's chances of ever being saved unsavory flavors to the palate of power, low value lives at a critical hour, paid no matter, paid no mind, caught in cast nets of human unkind. We all leave home, right? Most of us travel. It's just some have a choice. Some a louder voice. But these scales, they shift and change. So, how's about you? Would you take to the sea? Or give yourself to the flame? I was born, raised, and came to adulthood in South Africa at a time when that peculiar form of racial segregation and domination known as apartheid was all pervasive. Society was structured to maintain the supremacy of white people over black people through segregated living areas, segregated schools, public transport, toilets, even park benches. Those termed black in South Africa were overwhelmingly indigenous Africans, but included people of Indian descent and those of mixed parentage. Whites were very largely English or Afrikaans speaking. I came from a political family strongly opposed to racism and apartheid. 
Nevertheless, that intensely racialized society certainly affected me and my attitudes, and it has left its mark. Despite my family's politics, we were part of a privileged elite with servants to look after us, and it was difficult not to enjoy the privileges bestowed by our status. And yes, the effects linger, including the guilt. As a student in South Africa, I took part in anti-apartheid protests, demonstrations and sit-ins, working where we could with black students. Later, living abroad, I continued in the anti-apartheid cause at a time when the liberation struggle had revived and the case for economic and other boycotts was growing stronger. As I prepared for this talk, I saw on Facebook a slogan, peace cannot exist where justice is not served. And I think the truth of this, that you can't have peace in society until you have justice, was what spurred Nelson Mandela and other leaders to take up arms to liberate South Africa after all other avenues had been slammed shut. But in the end, it was more mass political mobilization within the country and economic sanctions from without that drove change towards democracy in South Africa, ushered in from 1990. Living abroad, it was with great joy that I voted in those first democratic elections in 1994. Real progress has been made since then, not always reported abroad, but there have been serious problems and setbacks. Economic inequality is the most persistent legacy of apartheid. But does this not mirror the wider dis economic disparities of our world. Is justice served where, where there is so little economic equity? I think not. So perhaps we need to ask why economic inequalities remain so persistent in South Africa and around the world between developed and developing nations. Apartheid in South Africa was so much more than a crazy 20th century racial dream. It grew from and was part of colonial history, which can be portrayed simply as conquest and colonization by Western powers of most of the world, followed by economic dispossession with indigenous people forced off the land, particularly the best land, to make way for white farmers and or cash crops grown for colonial markets. South Africa is a stark example of this wider reality. It points up the true nature of our highly unequal world. Economic inequality remains the driver of so many global problems, including the refugee crisis and the racism and prejudice that accompanies it. In order to achieve peace then, we need to overcome the economic injustices on which these prejudices thrive and build a fairer and more equal world where each person and nation is respected. How do we get there though? Well, start with small acts, help promote fair trade worldwide, respect others in the way we behave, and through educating ourselves and others, especially the young, to understand why the world is the way it is, and even how we might change it.
to Daniel Yeager from Rainbows Across Borders. We continue with our virtual collection plate and I'll share the details on the screen with you now. Thank you for your generous contributions and the many ways you may be supporting our chapel community. I now invite James to share his reflection on white privilege. Let me start from a perspective that might seem contrary coming from someone not white who has attended and spoken at Black Lives Matter demonstrations in the past couple of months. White privilege is a phrase I instinctively shrink from. Why? Because it is a racialized and stereotyping expression that is reductionist in apparently defining a person's main social attribute by their complexion. What I would like us to consider is that in fact, the discriminatory privilege that is signified by a person's color is actually based on attributes derived from the way in which power is exercised and has been exercised through history. It should be understood as a social construct. It is not a matter determined by an individual's personal identity, something that you personally have control over. Every white person in the US, Europe, or other parts of the global North where black, Asian, or other people who are not white suffer from discrimination is not automatically guilty of exercising white privilege. However, as human beings and citizens, we all have a social responsibility to understand the situation of people in the society we are part of and to act accordingly. Only by doing so are we able to contribute meaningfully to society and act upon Christ's exhortation in the Sermon on the Mount to do unto others as you would have them do unto you. In some measure, we each enjoy or suffer socially from being born to particular parents in a specific place and country and into a certain economic class. Thereafter, we grow up in a particular manner, either with the advantages of wealth and comfort or the disadvantage of poverty and want and have access to a good or a poor or no education. We then expect to move on to well-paid and highly regarded occupations or to poorly paid and low status jobs or maybe life as part of an underclass of long-term unemployed. White privilege reflects the fact that in modern Western societies, racialized through the legacy of several centuries of a globalized European system of colonial settlement and exploitation, slavery and indentured labor, important differences in how people are treated are manifested in social discrimination and institutional racism that operates particularly against black people. In conjunction with the class structure based upon the evolution of modern capitalism, it is the basis of what the US journalist Isabel Wilkerson's new book, Cast, The Lies That, Divides, that Divide Us, describes. She writes, what people look like or rather the, the race they have been assigned or are perceived to belong to 
is the visible cue to their caste. It is the historic flashcard to the public of how they are to be treated, where they are expected to live, what kinds of positions they are expected to hold. So, white privilege can be equated to belonging to a high caste, as opposed to being a despised untouchable in the Brahminical Hindu social system in India. And just as in India, you can find poor Brahmins, as well as a few wealthy or well-educated Dalits, the former untouchables, in the US or in Britain, the fact that there are many white people who have been dealt a raw deal, and some black people who have fared well, does not mean that there is no difference in the experience of being white or black. The point is that just as gender attributes or signifiers of class privilege have been hardwired into society, so has the privilege conferred by the accident of complexion. This is white privilege. We need to recognize that it exists, understand why it does, and as individual human beings, have the character to assume responsibility for transcending and ultimately eliminating it, whatever the color of our skin. Thank you. And this is the dream. See, you may say I'm a dreamer, but I ain't want to sleep. At least not relative to the sedative saturated streets. And at times it may be difficult to delegate between the greatest significance of waking life or dream when we live in a world where present reality of spiritual chaos and logical fallacy exists in this state, despite potential so great, is planned obsolescence, tumor growth as reference, for the feeding of facets that don't fulfill a family so much as fan the flames of farce fueling divisive insanity. So yeah, I dream to push the boundaries hold alternate perspectives and seed solutions found with ease. Kind of like open source design, the culminating of minds to create, compare, critique, reconstruct, and refine. Access over ownership, not only to knowledge, but all the resources that humans need to flourish. See, when there's no ecologics in our schools of economics, we destroy our habitat instead of learning from it. To build a better system grow a better system, like a regenerative society, where water, air and life aren't external anomalies. Simply base operations on what our world can sustain, because constant growth and consumption is a dead end game. Optimize efficiency, automate what we can, unleash untapped potential of liberated minds and hands. But what about the jobs? See, low employment is just fine if the work is being done in a fraction of the time by the tools and machines that we create for the purpose. You know, make practical abundance. Then make money worthless. Sharing is caring. It rhymes and it's true. Some fantasies can be realities if that's the path we choose. And no, nothing can be, be perfect. But this could definitely be better. Warp stories of our nature have our humanity fettered. All this survival of the fittest. You know Darwin wrote of that twice but of love 95 times in his great text on life. But certain points get cherry-picked to serve a particular purpose. 
Propagandas posing as proof override and usurp us. These stories that we stand by have great sway on our senses. We've been viewing ourselves through greed-tinted lenses. Add mutual aid to participate in the painting of the picture. Cooperative characteristics more ancient than the scriptures. Fertilize the soil to facilitate emergence. Recohere community to elevate our burdens. The winds whisper. The mountains are our sisters. We resonate through time space symphonic sound systems. Through solar storms, we are born like waves we will recede, like matters quite invisible. We permeate the scenes. Embodied in this moment, a process ever flowing, while deterministic chaos keeps the mystery ever going. I invite you now to please take a moment to center the struggle for black lives in our thoughts. You might like to speak the words, all of us need all of us to make it with me, loud or soft as we pray. In a world where some of us are targeted for struggle and brutality, where others are, of us benefit and flourish, we pray. All of us need all of us to make it. In a world where powerful people of ill will and indifference make us fearful for our safety and our futures, we pray. All of us need all of us to make it. In the excruciating space that lives between seeing and naming and hearing and changing, we pray. All of us need all of us to make it. You might like to picture someone in your mind you are not very happy with at this moment. Look at their face in your mind. and pray, all of us need all of us to make it. May we keep these words in our hearts. Thank you.
This weekend, we would have seen over a million people on the streets of Notting Hill in London for one of the largest street festivals celebrating Afro-Caribbean culture. The annual gathering first started in 1966 as a way to create interracial tolerance and honor diversity. There's dancing, singing, processions, costumes, there's all kinds of music, steel bands, reggae, salsa, and lots of food. Of course, this year the festival is all virtual, and I imagine with the present circumstances, this will feel even harder for those who expected to be out and proud about their heritage. As Unitarians, we believe in the inherent dignity and worth of all human beings. And if we consider over 300 years of Black lives not mattering, there is much work to be done to prove that their lives are important. In this world, we live in this, in this world we live in, we seem to repeat what we don't repair. If we want to make a difference, we need to do the work. And that can manifest in many forms from our own personal actions, as well as that of our community. When speaking of white privilege, some may consider white folk from disadvantaged backgrounds. And that's understandable to suggest that they are not in a place of privilege yet they might not be judged the same. They get to wear an invisibility cloak of white privilege. There isn't always a question of who is beneath that. As universalist John A. Powell from Berkeley says, the invisibility of whiteness means that one doesn't have to notice that one is white. So there are people and there are black people. There are people and there are Latino people. And people, just people, just folks, turn out to be white, but we don't notice it. White people have the luxury of not having to think about race. That is a benefit of being white, of being part of the dominant group. Just like men don't have to think about gender, the system works for you, you don't have to think about it. So they live in, in white space and they don't have to think about it. First of all, they think about race as something that belongs to somebody else. The blacks have race, maybe Latinos have race, maybe Asians have race, but they're just white, they're just people. That's part of being white. With this invisibility, white folk can walk around and not be noticed for some of the things that a person of color does. A black person, for example, can walk wearing the same clothes as a white person and get attention, whether positive or negative. If a white person and black person wear the same clothes, whether smart or scruffy, it will be the black person who will be observed and maybe commented on. Standing on a street corner, invisibility comes in. Maybe you'd like to try it. Stand there doing nothing and seeing what awareness comes to you. A black person doing the same would have maybe people staring, people concerned, hey, even having the police called on them. About 12 years ago, a white man broke into my family home, which resulted with my mother being in hospital. But when the police were called, their focus was on my teenage brothers and their friends who had been over after school, not the white man who, in, who entered forcefully into our homes. There was no justice. And this is one experience as an Asian person. And I can't even begin to imagine what that is like for someone of black or African descent. And that leads me to the story of a Somalian girl whose life was tragically taken last year. A 12 year old who relocated to the UK for safety from civil war, making a new life here. She died under questionable circumstances yet her death was immediately categorized as a tragic accident. Incredibly upsetting to hear when it was brought to my attention earlier in the year, my thoughts moved towards how much time, money and resources went into the search for a white girl who went missing from her parents' hotel room 13 years ago. One story gets little attention and the other gets international coverage. 
it's dis disconcerting the light that it sheds and the failure of authorities. But it also highlights the ingrained racism that exists in the system. And it's so easy to view the outside through a narrow lens. It's safe, it's comfortable. And we need to recognize what we don't understand. I'm sure many of us here will easily say, I'm not racist. I think we really need to consider this. American writer Ibram Kendi says, we have this long history of racists classifying themselves as not racist. Racists who cannot imagine that they have been reinforcing notions that there's something wrong with a particular racial group. Racists who can't imagine that the policies and policy makers are supporting are creating and reproducing racial inequality. Fundamentally, racism, its heartbeat, has always been denial. And the sound of that heartbeat has always been, I'm not racist. To be more specific, the sound of the heartbeat has always been not racist. It might seem tough and unpleasant, but there is honest work to be done to bring about authentic change, recognizing whether you are racist or anti-racist. Now I'd like to bring your attention to microaggressions and what messages they give. For example, asking someone where they're really from says that person is a foreigner. I don't see color denies a person's racial experience. Our lives begin to end the day we become silent about the things that matter, said Martin Luther King Jr. Now, as a group, we might consider the purpose of the Unitarian community now in 2020. We need to show a genuine interest in marginalized groups, a genuine interest in people of color, and how we can take part in the fight for racial justice and equality. With your privilege, you could teach other white folks the barriers to success for people of color, promise to listen to and amplify voices of people of color, be actively anti-racist, confront racial injustices even when it's uncomfortable. For those who respond with a head shaking or complaining about some of the tactics being used in the struggle for racial justice, how do we get them to engage with the cause? Reverend Aisha Ansano says this, it's not the specific methods that are making uncom people uncomfortable, it's the fact that the struggle for racial justice is seeping into their awareness in ways they can't ignore. Think about, this, think about it in terms of this metaphor. You're visiting a foreign country where the customs are very different from what you're used to and the language is different. And some of the things they do are not only different but make you feel deeply uncomfortable. As a guest in that country, it's not for you to say that the things that people who live there are doing are wrong. Instead, your role is to learn, to pay attention and to try to understand how things work and to adapt but if you do something that goes against their norms, it's also your role as a guest to not insist that they let you do things however you want to do them. It is your role as a guest to pause and consider what you're doing. White people tend to be visitors to the struggle of for racial justice, ones that aren't forced to be there but can choose to come in and leave whenever they like. People of color reside in the struggle for racial justice by virtue of their race. As people who are constantly in the struggle, people of colour have the right to make claims on what they find okay and not okay, what they see as helpful and not helpful. We light our candles and we send out light from this place and we hold our hearts with those hold our hearts with love, but we also need to show real solidarity. If we truly dream of bringing peace to those who suffer, we need to wake up and we need to work towards action. And may we continue in the pursuit for justice and peace and move into the light of holiness.
May it be so. I invite you to sing with me, We Have a Dream. words that melt the heart for peace and offer kindness so that this world will be conquered and ruled by love and may we go forth declaring our commitment to racial justice and equality and until we gather again may you go in peace mm -hmm.